Okay, let's start again. Um, any questions about last time? No questions? Okay. Uh, so today we're going to start an experiment. At least I'm going to teach you some stuff that I haven't taught before. Well, not everything. It's just the packs of stuff. Murphy has, uh, has uh, gotten control of me. Both of my mouses are not working, so that means mice are working, so I'm going to stand still behind the screen. So I want to start with uh, talking about fault tolerance. Um, the first part will cover everything up until uh, section 8.1 and 8.2. I sent you mail on the uh, updated material. Okay, I won't be discussing everything, but then you'll get a flavor of what the big difference will be with the, uh, with the current edition. And again, this is not reviewed material, so uh, it will most likely change, uh, but you'll get the big picture. Okay, let me see. I'm going to start by talking about uh, dependability. Um, and the most important statement that I want to make is that dependability is very close to security. And I always say that there are many people who disagree with me, but I think that they are wrong. And uh, fortunately, there are also many people who actually agree with me. And those are the ones I think are right. Um, so this is the abstract view. You've got a component, you actually got a series of components, and they, they basically, every component provides services to clients, okay? And in order to do that, okay, here's my mouse. In order to do that, um, a component may require the services of other components. I mean, this sounds very abstract, but if you think in terms of layered architectures, you see what happens. If, if a layer needs to provide a service to a higher level layer, it's going to depend on services of a lower level layer. It's as simple as that. And that means also, I'm having trouble with, is this mouse, I think the mouse is vanishing from time to time. I'm sorry about this, this is, uh, I'll see if I can correct this during the break. A component C depends on another one if the correctness of C's behavior depends on the correctness of this other component, okay? Now, to make it more concrete, if you think in terms of distributed systems, we're gonna talk about processes and channels. Oh boy, not help, next, okay. Now these are four, um, concepts that you need to understand. Availability, reliability, less important safety, and maintainability. Availability is the readiness to be used. Continuity of service delivery, delivery, delivery that's all about reliability. Safety is uh, no catastrophes. Maintainability, you can repair. Repair is actually very important, uh, notably in distributed systems. Okay. Let's look at reliability to give you an idea of what it actually is and what the difference is with availability. So you can formally specify reliability in, with respect to a time interval. And it says that the probability of the component has been up and running continuously. That's the, that's the key word here. In a time interval, let's say zero to t. And what they often do with reliability is relate these kind of traditional metrics that actually come from hardware, okay? So it's the mean time to failure. It's the average time until a component fails. Your processor goes down. Your hard disk goes down. The mean time to repair is how long it will take to actually get that thing up again. And that means that the mean time between failures is exactly the sum of those two. You can also apply this to software but it's more common just to relate this to hardware, okay? Availability is the average fraction of time that a component has been up and running in a specific interval. And what we often do is we extend this interval to, to infinity and then we just take a look at the average time that you're up and running. And there's this definition that you can actually see that the availability is the mean time between failures divided by, uh, the mean time to failure divided by the mean time between failures. Now what's, what's interesting about this whole reliability and availability is that you actually know 
that a failure occurred, that you have a good notion about failures, okay? And generally, this works pretty well for hardware. You know, smoke is coming out of, the, of your computer, or if you, 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 most of you will probably have experienced this, notably with laptops. Uh, they can get into a stage where uh, they work for a while and then they just shut down. In this case, it's not even Microsoft's fault. It's just that this thing is just getting so hot that, um, that the computer just breaks. And the solution, by the way, is just to get rid of all the dust in your laptop and it will survive for another half year or a year. So in hardware, it's often very clear. Not so when it comes to software. Actually discussing or de detecting that a failure has happened can be an extremely nasty problem in software. So let's introduce some terminology here. And this is actually kind of nice. We have failures, errors, and faults. So a failure may happen when a component is not living up to its specifications. That's when you say, oh shit, okay? It's not doing what's, what it's supposed to do. So that's, for example, a crash program. Now an error is conceptually that part of a component that may lead to a failure, a programming bug. So we all know that there are lots of bugs in software, right? And what we just hope is that none of these bugs will actually pop up. Uh, th there are really lots of bugs in programs. So a fault is the cause of an error. So where do bugs come from? They come from sloppy programmers. Or maybe not so sloppy programmers, they may be very good programmers, but every programmer will, at least if you are working on a non-trivial program, will actually produce bugs. Okay. That means that you can do a couple of things. You can do fault prevention. Well, you get the picture. Uh, you prevent the occurrence of a fault, and it can be done by not hiring sloppy programmers. Okay? You can do fault tolerance. You build a component such that it can mask the occurrence of a fault. So what you can do, and this is actually being done in software systems, you build each component by two independent programmers. They will just introduce different bugs. Okay? That's, that's, that's the whole idea. But at least, you know, if, they, if the two versions can work together, then, hey, you're a good move. Fault removal, the answer is on the slide. You reduce the presence number of seriousness of a fault by getting rid of sloppy programmers. That's fault removal. And fault forecasting, well, in this case, you don't go to the programmer. You actually go to the recruiter and see whether this guy or woman is actually doing a good job of hiring good or sloppy programmers. Okay? That's fault forecasting. So I can tell you, if I were a recruiter for a programmer, mm, I'm not quite sure how well I would do with hiring programmers. Um, okay, but you get the picture. More important for me is actually that you understand the difference between these three terms. And uh, I'm, I always try to be consistent in using these three, and I must confess I'm not always consistent, so watch out for that. And of course I am demanding that you guys are very consistent. Here comes the nasty part. We have to talk about failure models. And in many cases, we simply assume so-called crash failures. This means that a process, let's just keep it simple, uh, will halt, but up until the point that it halted, it was operating completely correctly. Okay, it was doing what it was supposed to do. So that's, that's, that's really nice. It's like, hey, I'm dead. Okay, and you can detect it and whatnot, everybody happy, okay? I, it's very dramatic, but at least it stopped, and you know that it stopped. Now you can have so-called general emission failures. These are a bit more nasty, because one way or the other, something is going wrong, but at least the program didn't crash. Okay, so in general it would, could mean that there's a failure in sending or receiving messages and then indeed you can talk about receiving emissions or sending <coughs> emissions. You have to realize that if you have, for example, a sending emission and you're on the recipient side, let's say that you can detect, well, you know, it's, it's still producing something, why isn't sending something back? So it's, it's 
hopefully, obviously, that it's, it's, it's a nastier prob problem because something fishy is going on and the program did not crash. There can be timing failures. We all know this. We experience this all the time. Um, you get correct output, but it's way too slow. That's the general case. Um, or it's actually way too fast. And everybody say, hey, no problem with way too fast. Well, if you're a, a media streaming device, and I think I gave this example before, and you're getting tons of data to process, you're not going to like that. You're going to tell the other one, slow down. Yes? It's like the uh, Windows 95 problem until Windows 95 T, I think, where it would crash and too fast time to CPU. Shall I repeat this for, the, for, for, for everyone? It's like, thank you very much, Windows 95 running on a Pentium processor. It would actually crash on the Pentium processor? I don't know. Okay, well, that, that's a, that, if that's the case, and uh, let's just assume for, 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 the, for the sake of argument that it is the case. So if you would have an operating system, I don't think it's specific to Windows 95, but the example is okay, that if it was, um, if it had an operation, a loop operation, and it was assuming that the loop operation would take place within a certain time unit, and you would then run on a way too fast processor that would violate that assumption, you would have a timing failure. Absolutely. Nice example. Um, so here, here, here comes the nasty part, response failures. Okay? Now, um, you could have incorrect outputs, but it cannot be accounted to another component. So you're getting stuff back, and one that is, I guess, a, a bit okay-ish is a value failure. So basically, one plus one is three. Mm. You know, that, that's wrong. So let's assume that it's, it's a failure that you can detect. Now, you can also have state transition failures, and these may be a bit more nasty. And the example that I always give is that you talk to another server, you get the right answer back, but in the meantime, the server actually moved to a wrong state. So the next time you send a message to that server, abiding by the rules of the protocol, that server suddenly does something weird, okay? That is typically an example of a state transition failure. You were not expecting the, the server to respond or not respond uh, in the way that it did when you would send the, mes the second message of the protocol. Um, so this is what I mean that that failure may not be initially observable, okay? Well, in the in due time it could be. Now, the nasty ones are the arbitrary failures. You get something back. It could be, in principle, anything. And the real nasty ones is you don't even notice. Okay? Something's going on, but only after a while you start suspecting the system. Wait a minute. This, this, this doesn't make any sense. And the problem is it may take a long while before you actually start thinking, wait a minute, something's not wrong. Those are the nasty arbitrary failures. And we're going to concentrate a bit on those later. Now, a colleague of mine, who, the one who actually explained everything about the Byzantine fault tolerance, he said, you know, um, what we really need to do is make a distinction between emission failures and commission failures. And I kind of like this. This was actually uh, introduced, oh, I think, in 19, 1985, something like that. Um, and it's interesting for, for a very simple reason that I'll explain. If you take a look at what an emission failure is, a component fails to take an action that it should have taken. Okay? A commission failure is a component takes an action, action that it should not have taken. And the reason why I'm saying this is that in many cases people will talk about Byzantine failures, and Byzantine has an association of... Um, uh, deliberately malfunctioning attacks okay so you see that deliberate failures be they emission or commission failures they stretch out to the field of security 
And what you do is when you talk about emission failures and commission failures is that you throw away the judgment. It, it's not the case, I'll give you an example actually. Um, it's not the case that if I have an infected computer and I don't know that it's infected, for example by a botnet, that doesn't make me a bad computer. I may just start exhibiting emission or commission failures because of the botnet, okay, because of the infection. But that doesn't necessarily make me a criminal, as our uh, minister actually wants to believe. Um, but that's a whole different story. And now you see that when you start talking in terms of failures, you're actually moving into the field of security. And that's the reason why I think I'm right. And Lorenzo Alfizi, who is an authority on, on the area of failures, says, yeah, you're absolutely right. And then he pointed to me, well, you know, you can actually talk about emission and commission failures. Good for Lorenzo. Um, now, let's talk about halting failures. Okay, um, so now we have the scenario that we have a component that doesn't see anything. You know, it's, it's, it's a client, then we'll talk to a server, the server is not talking back. Now, what kind of conclusion can it draw? Well, in fact, it's very difficult to draw conclusions. What you need to do is you need to make some assumptions about your system. And Here's where the theoreticians have been fighting for years, and uh, uh, practitioners actually came up with a practical solution. You could talk about a fully asynchronous system. In a fully asynchronous system, you make no assumptions about the process execution speeds or the message delivery times, okay? Now, this is kind of a nasty situation because if you're not getting anything back, it will be impossible for you to detect whether the server is down or that you know something went wrong in the communication or that the server is just slow you cannot say anything about that and this is a fundamental result in distributed systems research under the assumption of, of asynchronous system you cannot reliably detect that a server crashed no matter what you want to do so that's a fundamental issue. So what you can do is assume that you're dealing with a synchronous system. So suddenly everything is now bounded, okay? Message delivery times are bounded and uh, the speed of, of, an, of a server is well known. Under those assumptions, you can start using timers and if you're not getting an answer back, you can say, hey, I can conclude that this part of the system is not living up to its specifications it just halted. Because I'm dealing with a synchronous system, something went wrong, it can only have halted. Unfortunately, synchronous systems don't exist. Because Mother Nature is always getting in our way. So what do we do is we talk about partially synchronous systems. And it's, it's kind of a subtle thing. What you basically assume is that under normal circumstances, normal circumstances, you're dealing with a synchronous system. So it's not unreasonable to assume that you actually can get messages back within a certain time, okay? And you can actually do reasonable estimates of what that time could be. And what you do then is that you design the whole system and your algorithms to make use of those assumptions. Which means that if you do see that a message is not delivered within a certain time, you will then say, well, it's probably crashed. And the only thing you have to take into account is that you may be very, very wrong. Okay? That's a partially synchronous system. So that means that under normal circumstances, you can reliably detect crash failures. Normal circumstances. But in exceptional circumstances, you cannot. You had a question? Well, always is uh, now suddenly turned a bit soft, okay? So what you try to do is you try to build up a very reasonable picture of what the system would normally do and that you handle accordingly when the system is really not behaving normally. And it may take a while before you can actually decide that a system is acting normal or not normal. 
And I think it's actually uh, a very important result because if you take a look um, a few slides down the, uh, down the road, when I'll be talking about uh, K-fault tolerant groups, you make assumptions that, okay, if you have a certain number of processes, then you can always withstand uh, the fact that a number of processes crashes. So then immediately happens, so the, the question pops up, what happens if too many processes crashes? Crash. Well, then all bets are off. And what that means is that you just came into a, an exceptional situation, and then all the theory doesn't work anymore, and you just have to go into a different mode. Okay? Which means forget about the system and, and get your experts in, in, into, the, into the playground to actually fix what's going on. That's the whole idea, which works very well from an engineering point of view. Okay. Now, the assumptions we can make when it comes to uh, halting failures are so-called fail-stop semantics, that you're, abiding, that you're uh, uh, playing the, uh, the whole game according to the rules of fail-stop semantics. That means that you have crash failures, you know, process of blah, just grow dead, okay, and that they can also be reliably detected. Yes? I have a question about the previous slide. Yes? So, um, in synchronous system, you can make uh, a time for a message. In a synchronous system, yes. Um, why having no assumptions at all in a synchronous system? We can, we can have the same assumption. We can say uh, that this message should come back in 10 minutes from the Um. The reason why you cannot, the reason why you cannot assume, the reason why you do not want to assume an asynchronous system is that it's just not practical. Because you cannot say anything, if you're not getting a response back, you will never be able to make a statement like, oh, the process just crashed. And this is, this is a statement you do want to make. Because if you can't make this statement, there's no reason to try to repair anything. See my point? So let's assume that all distributed systems are asynchronous. I can, I can rephrase this, yeah. Let's make this assumption. The distributed system is asynchronous. Under those circumstances, you will have to tr start to develop lots of intricate mechanisms to let that system continue to work under reasonable circumstances um, and all these mechanisms that you will be introducing may be totally unnecessary if you can assume that the system was fully synchronous. To give you an example, a timeout it doesn't make any sense in an asynchronous system. Because it, you know, if you're not getting an answer back for two hours, that's, that's still reasonable. Or if you want to um, make sure that, uh, no, if, if, if you don't want to make any assumptions about crashing processes, then that's okay, but you, know, you want to do that? And how can you build um, reliability into your system if it's always completely asynchronous? You, you, you're not even allowed to try to detect failures. It's impossible. Yeah, it is. That is an extreme. And that's why I'm saying the, the practitioner's approach is that you assume a partially synchronous system, which basically says, yes, it's very reasonable to assume that you could use timers. And when they go off, then there's something wrong and you come to conclusions, and the only thing that you have to take into account from time to time is that your conclusions were incorrect. So you may conclude that that process just crashed, and then suddenly it's up and running again. Oh, shit, what should I, exactly. And then you have to be prepared to do something about that. Okay, but it's in the, in the exceptional part of your space. And that, that, that works pretty well. Okay. Could you give an example of such a system that works uh, partially 
Um, yeah, let, yeah I, I know a very good one, actually. Uh, let's take TCP. Okay, so what you do with TCP sequence numbers is that you let a, uh, you, you make the assumption that a server can crash, that it will pop up again, and that the clock on the machine that that server was running was still working, which is not an unreasonable assumption. And then what you do is that you jump fast forward into the sequence space in order to detect all packets. Okay? Now, on the recipient side, this is exactly what you would be prepared for. So you will be receiving packets, and some of them pop up out of the blue, out of the network, because, you know, they were delayed for a very long time. But at least you can now detect so-called old sequence numbers, which is more or less of an exception, and then you just discard them. So that's an, ex that's an I think, an, I, I just came up with this example off the top of my head, but that's an example where you, um, that you treat these old things really, that you are able to detect them as, oh, they'll just ignore them. Wh whatever importance or whatnot, they'll just completely ignore them. Okay? Uh, are there other examples? Um, let's assume that you indeed have a very, very slow server. So you're not getting response back, and what you do is you simply uh, start it again. And let's assume that you are allowed to have multiple instances of that server that can work independently from each other. Now what you just, but you only want one. Now what you just did, you start two servers on the same machine, for example. One of these servers was, I don't know, was having a hiccup or whatnot, and it starts responding. That's an exception. And there are many ways of dealing with this, and you can say, well, well, what's going on? And you do a complete reboot or whatnot, or you say, oh, no, I just ignore it. Let's, let's, let's see what's going on. You could go to your administrator. Ah, oh, you have two instances of the server. Let me just kill one. Okay? But going to the administrator, that's, maybe you're the administrator, that's part of operating in the exceptional part of your space. Okay? Um, let's go back to this list. So, fill stop means uh, crash failures are good, we can detect them. Um, fill noisy is, again, more of this practical thing. Crash failures and eventually reliable, de reliably detectable. That means, you know, it may take a long time, but we can do it. That's more or less realistic. Fill silent, very realistic. Um, omission or crash failures, but you cannot tell what, what went wrong. Uh, this is a kind of a nasty one, um, and if it's necessary to build a system that can handle these things, you'll just be looking at much more mechanisms to implement, okay? Fill safe, you can have arbitrary failures, but fortunately they can't do any harm, okay? And then the fill arbitrary, these, this is really nasty, uh, arbitrary with malicious failures. So if you really want to have a system that can withstand these things, uh, be prepared. That's where the heavy duty stuff comes in. I think this is a fascinating field actually. Um, the systems folks have this tendency of putting lots of stuff into their systems to make them, um, make them able to handle fail arbitrary semantics. And the trick is with Many real-world distributed systems, uh, you often just really get humans in the loop for, for reasons of sanity. You know, when the going gets tough, you get your experts, and they, they look at your system, they well, what's going on over here? And the system cannot then uh, take its own measurements. And I, I, I always give this example related to security, just to give you an idea of that there's no sharp line between a, a system and the non-systems part. So here's a question. I think I, I posed this question before. I'm not quite sure. Uh, how secure does a credit card have to be? Secure what is secure enough? That you can't work through either both. You can break the, 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 the security, but if, it's, uh, if you spend more money than you can uh, get from breaking it, then it's not work. So, okay, so, okay, we could argue whether this would be a good one. But basically what you're saying, um, 
It depends how much you want to pay for the security. And you're actually saying, how much can I afford taking an insurance against misuse of my credit card? That will be also my answer. Now, apart from the correctness of that answer, what you're seeing is that the system is now moving into a different domain, and you can actually, you sh I think you should actually uh, attach these two. So when it comes to failures, you know, um, how robust must, it, must the distributed system be? And then people will say, well, you know, you can't lose any data. Oh, why not? And the question would be, how much is your data worth to you? Okay, which is a, a very, very difficult question to answer, but it's a very important one to address because it's the worth that you attach to your data that's going to decide, be determined on the mechanisms that you want to put into your distributed system. So here you are operating in this gray area, and you know, maybe so. I, I don't need, I don't need fault tolerance at all because hey. My data is not that worth much worth to me. Or to give you a very practical example, I have a, uh, a music server at home. And of course, I run backups. You know where my backup device is? It's, it's a hard disk that sits just under this other hard disk. That's not very wise because if my house burns down, you know, I will have lost two disks. And there's a lot of stuff on those two disks. But I think I'll probably be more sorry that my house burned down than I just lost, you know, lots of music, okay? But it would have been better to move one disk over here to the VU and then have the backups on a regular basis be done overnight. That is definitely safer. But hey, apparently it's not worth the effort. Because it's, it's, uh, there's no good answer to this, but it's, I think it's important to think about it. Okay. So let's, let's move on to process resilience. Um, and the whole basic idea, and I just gave a hint of this, how do you, how do you protect yourself against uh, faults? Well, you just replicate stuff. And there are basically two methods when it comes to replicating processes. You have a flat group. You can call it symmetric. You know, it's just a bunch of uh, processes that operate together, often in the kind of a lockstep mode, using active replication. Hey, that's stuff from the previous chapter. Um, and they kind of work in sync. Okay? And we'll be discussing one of these in just a minute. And you can also have hierarchical groups and you have a coordinator with workers. That's really, yes, the primary backup approach. Both are used. Okay? So if you have that, then the question is, how many of these guys do you need to create a K-fault tolerant group? And what's a K-fault tolerant group? When a group can actually mask any K concurrent member failures. And K is then called a degree of fault tolerance. So how large must a K-fault tolerant group be? Well, if you only have halting failures, crash, emission, timing failures, you need K plus one members. Which is kind of obvious when you think about it, because I'll just quote this, no member will produce an incorrect result that's your assumption. So the result of one member is good enough. Got it? However, as soon as your buddies can start producing all kinds of results, you need two K plus one members. Because what you'll need to do is you'll have to vote. Okay? So with arbitrary failures, you need two K plus one members, and the correct result can be obtained only through a majority vote. Yes. Um, is 2K plus 1 always enough? Uh, what if all processes, uh, we're talking arbitrary failures, so anything can go wrong. What if they all contain the same bug and all stuff is the wrong answer? I, lo I really like this question. So now you have your uh, K fault tolerant group, and a majority in that group produces the wrong answer. Yes. Yeah. So you have more than K processes now failing. Then what? Everything is out the window. What? Everything is out the window. 
Everything's out the window. Okay? You, you, you call in the failure police. There's, there's, there's nothing else you can do. This is, you're now operating in a different space. Because the assumption was that you can only handle up to K faults. But now you have at least K plus one, hey, all bets are off. Tough luck for you. The question is that you want to make sure or that you want to have a certain probability that that's not going to happen. Okay? So what you can do is you can indeed produce a K fault tolerant group and under realistic assumptions about when a process can actually fail and recover again, you can compute how reliable or available that group is. Yes? Yes. Yes. So, so f let me first repeat what you just said. If you if you're dealing with um, uh, arbitrary failures, you always have to have an odd number of servers in your group. Yes. Continue. So then, uh, one node fail. Well, somebody uh, probably has a power plant. Uh huh. Let's, let, let's, oh, I, this is a very good observation. Okay, so let's, let's, let's get into uh, a specification mode here. So let's say I have um, a K fault tolerant group with uh, K is two, arbitrary failures, I need five servers. Okay, one server goes down. Am I happy? You said something very important. Can you repeat this? Fix it. Fix it. Okay. So I'm still happy provided that I fix it. And I'm still living up to my expectations. Okay? But I'm entering a danger zone. Because I do not, this is very important, I do not have a K fault tolerant group anymore. But compared to the original one, I'm still doing fine. Agreed? Yes, because I said I can tolerate up to two processes failing. So far, only one has gone down. Now, what you may be arguing is, say, listen, you are indeed operating in the danger zone because if you really want to have still two processes being able to fall down, you better start getting into repair mode because that is really living up to your expectations. And now you're still although in a phase that one process, another, another process failure is also still okay, but you're not going to tolerate this for a long while. Yes? The same with the arbitrary failures with the halting failures. If you have basically a halting failure and an arbitrary failure resistant group tension, yes. um, you end up in a state where you have two K nodes. Yes. Because you lost one. Mm -hmm. But you got to realize, so that's that's the so basically, if you know, if you just st start dropping uh, servers from your group, you will see that the remaining group is not living up to the original specifications. That's absolutely true. But you have to take this from the perspective of the original group. Okay, that's the reason why I'm saying you're living in the danger zone. And you do have to get into repair mode because what you really wanted was is this guarantee that you can always tolerate more failures. The thing is, if you reduce your expected K by one, and just kill one of the nodes, so you have, again, an odd number of nodes, you can again handle <coughs> the arbitrary failures. Oh, that's what you mean. Oh, OK, you're talking about a different problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
So, so oh, this is interesting. Uh, food for thought during the uh, break, which I'll uh, uh, announce in just a couple of minutes. So if you have five servers, one goes down, and you're collecting results from four remaining servers, and now you get two who say A and the other two say B, what do you do? Th that No, I just had one server failing. So you have one server failing and yep. two uh, giving the wrong and two giving the right answer. Yep. So that's one halting and two arbitrary failures. So that's three failures total. So you're not... You do not have the majority. No. Yeah. The problem is you don't have a majority at the moment. Oh, 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 that's an interesting one. Um, Oh, okay, I, I see what you mean. Uh, that is the correct answer. <laughs> so the correct answer is, okay, so, uh, if, thank you. So what do you do? You conclude that you're off, okay? Because the whole thing is now not living up to its specifications. One server down and two producing the wrong result. You have three failing servers. Very good. Got it? Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, that's why I say you gotta get into specification mode. That, that helps a lot. Okay. Um, okay, last slide before the break. Now, what I am assuming in these fault tolerant groups is that all members are identical. That's a very important one. And all members process commands in the same order, okay? And the results, only then do we know that all processes are programmed to do exactly the same thing. So I'm really talking about process replication. That's very, very important. Now, in order to ensure this, what these processes in these groups need to do is reach consensus. They need to reach consensus on which command to execute. Because the, the model is like this. You have this group of processes you send a command, a request to this group of processes, so to you as a client it appears as a single logical process, and these guys collectively have to do the same thing to, in order to produce the same result. So they need to reach consensus. Now, how that is done, I will start discussing that after the break. Hold it just a minute while I can...